waiting for you. We are waiting for Dave Asprey to join. Uh, anyhow, I know you're, you're going to join now. Anyway, we're going to be talking about fasting, why it's important, some of the biochemistry behind it, why, uh, what, why it does some of the great stuff that uh, it does, and uh, connecting. It's that It works. It, it works. You look good. Good to see you. Where are you right now? I'm up in Victoria, British Columbia. I know of this place. I, I know of this Victoria, British Columbia. How is you, it there? Oh, it's fantastic weather. We had the most beautiful sunset I've seen in 10 years on the island this morning to celebrate my book launch. I was like, all right. And thank well, you for having me. Uh, we, are, so we are delighted. Oh, yeah. you know, I think on Instagram this portrays a backwards, but anyway, it's fast this way. Everybody knows Dave Asprey. They'll find the book. And it, it's really interesting, uh, the book. I have to say that, um, you know, you make it easy for people, which is, I think, really very, very important. And you really broaden the whole notion of what is fasting. You know, uh, you start off talking about your time four days in a cave under the direction of a shaman and how you weighed 300 pounds and you had uh, autoimmune thyroiditis and how you really reconnected. Let's just say you reconnected to the yes. part of your genome that wants Dave Asprey and wants everybody else to be healthy. And this is kind of a fast track to, uh, you know, to getting to that, that sort of reprogramming. Tell us about that. I realized when I weighed 300 pounds that I was afraid of being hungry. And there were two reasons for that. I, I'd been taught if you don't eat six times a day, you'll go into starvation mode. Starvation equals death. And I truly believe that. But even worse, if I didn't eat all the time, I would get hypoglybitchy. And then I would act like a jerk. And then I was afraid of acting like a jerk because then I would be mean to people I cared about. It would be bad for my career. And so I had this looming, not that conscious sort of fear and anxiety, like skipping breakfast. I could never do that. Like it's the end of the world. And to go from there to the Bulletproof diet and, and having people lose a million pounds, incorporating intermittent fasting with recommendations. I just realized most people still, when they hear about fasting, it's scary. And they experience a lot of pain and, and pushing and suffering and hunger when they start doing it. And it's not necessary. So there's three big fasting hacks I wanted to share with the world, along with this idea of don't overfast, because I, I, I helped to make keto popular, and so have you, by the way. But you know what happens if someone never eats any carbs and they go keto all the time and they never take a break? It doesn't oftentimes work. So we run into this with fasting too. Well, fasting 18 hours is good. Maybe one meal a day is good. Maybe I'll do that every day. And all of a sudden, I, I see women, and I have for years, who are saying, oh, I did this for two months and my hormones broke. So they just, how do we be kind to ourselves? How do we fast enough, right? But not too much. And how do we do it in such a way that we can do things while we're fasting that turn off the hunger so we can do a working fast or we can sit down and say, I'm gonna go deep and do a spiritual fast because they're just different things. That, yeah, and I, I, right off the bat, you know, you call attention to the fact that the, the, the idea of fasting doesn't necessarily just mean food. I mean, you talk about a lot of different things that we can distance ourselves from, that we can fast away from, uh, which I thought was really uh, one of the very interesting things about the book. There's a couple other things we'll, we'll get to, but uh, I think you, uh, what, where you're going right now is the notion of cycling, uh, you know, not being dedicated to something and, and almost orthorexic in the world of fasting, that you've got to, you know, toe the line 24-7, 365. And the reality is, if we are trying to emulate the the environment of our ancestors, then it wouldn't be dedicated to one, uh, you know, one sort of notion of how we should eat all the time. Because that was one thing we can assume would characterize the lifestyle of our ancestors was kind of feast and famine, was kind of cycling, and uh, which we can apply to a number of conversations, whether it's uh, anab anabolism versus autophagy, you know, cycling between building up and tearing down. You know, it's almost like the, uh, the bird song, uh, to every day, to everything, turn, 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 you know, time to build right. up, time to break down. So you open up the door for that. And um, you also mentioned, I think it's really very important, the notion of gratitude. And I think that Alan, your son, uh, in the <laughs> section you talked about Alan, how he's 10 years old, it's in the book, so I'm going to just say it, uh, how he said it's like the spice how he talked yeah. about fasting. He finally broke his fast and had dinner. It was like the spice. It made the food uh, so much more flavorful. And, you know, it does that beyond your, your eating. It's a, a sense of gratitude that you get when you break a fast. 
you know, well beyond the fact that you now have food. It's totally true. And, and we should make sure to point out, don't have your kids fast very often. This is a case where Alan said, Daddy, I've seen you writing this book. I've seen you fasting. I want to try it once. And I want to do it without any of the fasting hacks. I want to see if I can do it. And he wanted to do a 24 hour, just, he had dinner and he's going to wait till the next dinner. So he's going to skip two meals. But you don't want your kids fasting all the time. It sends an epigenetic signal that's not good for them. But at the end, he said, oh, this is the best meal I've ever had. Fasting is the best spice. And it, it was so precious because it was about proving something to himself. Yeah. But just please don't fast kids all the time. That's not a good path. And even for adults, if you fast all the time, it's not a good path either. You just fast some of the time, especially for women. And some new studies came out literally in the last year around fasting and women. And they found that a 12 to 18 hour fast, three days a week was providing all kinds of metabolic benefits. And they also found that there's times when for women, you might not want to fast. You know, if, if you're right in the middle of menstruating, that's a time when you might want a little extra protein. And it's not a day, you have enough physiological stress. So we use fasting like exercise, but exercise doesn't have to, to suck. And fasting doesn't have to either, because now we have tools that selectively turn off the hunger hormones. And that's what makes you feel so much different. Well, you do have a section in the book where you talk about uh, athletic performance uh, enhancement by engaging what you're talking about in the book, by engaging types of fasting. Now, how does that work? Um, it turns out that when you try your first workout when you're in a fasted state at the end of, say, a 16 or, or an 18 hour intermittent fast, most people are saying, I didn't have as good of a workout. But some people say, I actually just had my personal record. I'm like, what? How could that happen? Well, a certain amount of your energy is going into digesting your food. And when there's no food in your stomach, that energy is available for other things. It can fold proteins. It can do autophagy. And sometimes that little boost is enough. And also, if you've kicked yourself into ketosis, ketones have more electrons than carbs. So that could be a factor as well. But even if you work out and you're like, that wasn't my best workout, that's okay. Because when you, when you suppress this thing called mTOR that we talked about, it pushes down this thing that causes muscles to grow. And it's like a spring. The more you load it, the more of a spike you're going to get. So there's three things we know that will push mTOR down. One of them is fasting. <laughs> one of them is coffee, my favorite drink. And one of them is exercise. So what you've done, you fasted, you had your coffee, and then you exercised. And you've like taken this spring, and you like scrunched it down. And then after you exercise, you have a meal with some protein, some healthy fat, and probably some carbs, but not sugar. Yes, and then it goes, carbs. For me, Boy. I will tell you that, yes, uh, after a fast, some carbs, my next day performance is, is definitely better. Um, I just have to say that, you know, I've been doing a lot of interviews as of late, and everybody is on board with coffee. And I think there's a huge amount of confirmational bias that goes on. I'll admit it. I'm the first to admit it. If there's a study that comes out saying coffee is good for anything, oh, I latch onto that and, and I'll write a blog about it because I, you know, I love my coffee. Yeah. <laughs> it, although if, if you were to take any disease you can think of and Google coffee and that name, it's pretty amazing what's out there. And even if you, you do your very best to remove a coffee bias, and you just count studies, there are a huge number of beneficial studies, way more so than there are for kale. Um, you know, let, yeah. Let's just be straight <laughs> for it. <laughs> but, but I will say that, you know, and they try to deconstruct coffee to its caffeic acid or caffeine and try yeah. to determine what is the active ingredient. And, you know, at this stage in life, I think we, we're kind of getting away from the notion of active ingredient. But yeah. you do call attention to a Canadian study in your book. Uh, that talks about the amplification of ketone production in with coffee consumption. I think that was actually uh, San Diego, UC San Diego, if I remember right. Wasn't that Dr. Mm -hmm. I could. Uh, you know what? I, I won't on the side look it up here. You know me. Okay, got it. No, but if, no, if no, you were certain right. Canadian, I was but like, I could I, be wrong. My memory that. says it was Cunane's work, but I. I I'm not going to I'm not going to trust myself 100 percent. I'm 90 percent there. But what I would so, say is, uh, you know, you want to be sure, uh, I think, in messaging that when you talk about uh, caffeine consumption, we're not seeing a frappuccino that's loaded with, you know, you mentioned black coffee, add the butter, add uh, uh, your fuel, MCT fuel, uh, brain, yeah. brain octane. Uh, but, you know, I think let's be clear when you're when you're talking about caffeine, what is it that you're talking about or coffee per se? Yeah. In, in the study that we're both talking about, they actually tested the amount of caffeine 
present in two small cups of coffee, but it was just caffeine in that study. And they said it doubled ketone production. And the reason that matters during a fast is you go back you know, 500 years, you'd fast, and after the second day, your ketones would go up. And then you get all this energy and you could do your spiritual work and you're connected to the universe and like really good stuff happens from a little bit of ketones. But if you can turn those ketones on on your first day of a fast, the side effect of ketones is that they suppress ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone, and they raise CCK, which is a fullness hormone. And it's totally okay to just say, I'm gonna power through it and have water. I just don't think it works if you're gonna power through it with just water when you're trying to get your, your day's work done on Zoom and you've got a kid hanging off each arm and you've got too much going on, the powering through part is harder to do. But if you add just black coffee as a fasting hack, you're likely to succeed better. And if you step it up a notch and say, let's add some MCT oil and you make a really good MCT oil as well, you can add that to your coffee and you can add a little bit of grass-fed butter. And the reason, it doesn't have to be much, it can be a half a teaspoon and you blend it. And the reason you blend it is new science from University of Washington. And they showed that when you blend butter oil in coffee, or sorry, not in coffee, in water even, but coffee works as well, it changes the structure of the water into something called exclusion zone water that you can see in a microscope. So this isn't like the magical fairy drinking water. This is a visible border in the water where the viscosity changes. And that's the type of water that we use to make ATP and to do our biological processes. Normally you drink water and then your body uses body temperature uh, increases, basically body heat, when it puts the water next to your cell membranes and it creates this. But you skip that step, which means you can use that liquid immediately for energy production. Oh, and you got some ketones at the same time. It's like, no wonder your brain wakes up. But uh, yeah. Well, you've gotten a couple of questions here uh, asking about uh, the addition of fiber. And, and you do actually cover that. You talk about uh, using uh, dietary fiber. It, and why don't you walk us through, though it's a carbohydrate, why we don't really consider that if we are fasting. It's, it, to my knowledge, this is the first book talking about doing that during a fast. And I know it's going to make the water only fasters who look at mouse studies very angry at me. But here's the logic. Are you already there with the coffee? So you're, you're, you're already broke the ice. Don't worry about I, it. I, I already pissed off some, uh, some uh, I like to suffer fasters. Uh, by the way, a water-only fast is just fine if that's what works for you. Like, like no, no hate on that, but there are Can other ways. Can I just say before you go any further, that's what's great about your book. It's so inclusive. You know, that yeah. water-only, but if you want to have fiber, you want to have coffee, you want to add a little, uh, there are actually some supplements that you talked about as well. Uh, thank you. And I, it, it, we don't have to have like dietary wars over something as simple as fasting. And what I'm talking about is prebiotic soluble fiber, not necessarily the coarse fiber. And the reason you might do this during a fast is that, well, number one, it's associated with a reduction in all-cause mortality. It makes you live longer. Number two, most people don't get enough of it in their diets anyway. And number three, it doesn't raise insulin at all. And the hallmarks of a fasted state are stable insulin and the fact that you didn't have any protein because protein affects mTOR and affects autophagy. So when you have this stuff, it goes into your body. Your body says, I can't digest it. But the gut bacteria are like, yeah, let's have a party here. And when they eat it, they make short chain fatty acids called butyric acid. And that is actually pro ketogenic. So what happens is you supported the good bacteria during a fast and you got the energy and the hunger suppression from the fiber. So if you were to go and use all three hacks on your very first intermittent fast, you took a cup of black, hopefully mold free coffee, you add your MCT, a tiny bit of butter, you blend it up, you add a little bit of soluble fiber or this prebiotic fiber. And by the way, you make a really good soluble fiber um, that I, I think is, is delicious. And when you do that, um, you drink it and you're like, I just don't care about food. People can stack donuts all around you. And instead of using your willpower to go, I'm not gonna eat the donut, I'm not gonna eat the donut. You're like, I just don't want the donut. And it's that freedom to focus that for me as a, when I was really heavy, I did not have that. It was, it was so just, you know, the food would yell at me and sometimes I'd win, sometimes it would win. I don't think we all have to suffer. And if you use the fasting hacks to get going, on this to start building metabolic flexibility, you'll get to the point in three or six or nine months or maybe two years is about the longest it takes. That's how long it took me to get there. Um, what you end up with is a body like, yeah, I could just have black coffee. I could just have tea. I could have nothing. Like I'm totally good to go. And it's that freedom. It's hard to put words to it as someone who's, who's you know, really metabolically broken at a point in my life to just be okay with being hungry. So what are the sort of, uh, 
metrics that you might follow when you're involved in fasting? What do you do to, uh, are you checking your blood sugar? Do you have a continuous glucose monitor? What do you do to see where you are? I have, you guys probably can't see it. I have a levels health uh, monitor on the back of my arm. And I, I love doing that. And one of the most interesting things you'll find is you'll be sitting down going, man, I'm so hungry. I need to eat right now. And if you look at your blood sugar and it's 110, wait a minute. I have plenty of, of, of available energy for my body to use right now. It's not using it. Therefore, my craving is either caused by something I ate, which is a major cause of cravings, your last meal, or is caused by boredom or loneliness <laughs> or some other emotional thing. Stress. Yeah, stress. And you can unpack that and be like, oh, now I'm in charge of this. But you can own your biology that way. And I looked at all the, the stuff. I mean, I've written a substantial number of books, not quite as many as you. Um, but I'm working on it, you know, and I got to get busy. <laughs> well, if, I mean, I, I've read all of your books. They're fantastic. Uh, and what I, I find is, is I, I can put everything in a book and then it can be overwhelming. But if you look at the one thing everyone can do, think about it, less energy in the morning to, to just have coffee or to have nothing instead of breakfast, less money and less time. So you actually got paid right now it was a negative investment and you got paid right away because you had more energy in the morning. And you got paid long term because your metabolism got healthier and you reduced your diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease risk. So I got paid now. I got paid short term. I got paid long term. But there was no cost. So it's the highest return on investment behavior you can take. I would argue intermittent fasting is probably more important than exercise and as important as moving if you want to live a long time. You should also exercise. You should also move. But it is it deserves a place of its own, whether or not you're vegan, whether or not you live on Doritos and nachos, you can still intermittent fast and you're gonna be better off doing that than nothing. Well, we're getting a lot of uh, comments about the continuous glucose monitor. And I will say that uh, in, uh, to be straightforward uh, about it in, in disclosure, I'm uh, on the advisory board of Levels Health. Oh, I, I am too. I, I, I wear, I wear the both. monitor and yeah. I think to have that level of understanding as to how whatever lifestyle choice I engage in affects my blood sugar is incredibly, incredibly empowering, well beyond food choices. Uh, whatever activity I'm involved in, knowing what my blood sugar is doing when I'm exercising, how is it when I wake up, what if I didn't sleep well the night before, uh, et cetera. So uh, the, you know, what Levels Health is, is really it's the, the software that takes the data from your, from your glucose monitor and then does wonderful things with it, giving you great information. And, you know, um, it, it's uh, unfortunately, I think most places still require a prescription to get uh, that glucose monitor. And you have to probably tell your doctor uh, or you probably have to have diabetes or near it to get a continuous glucose monitor, which to me makes zero sense. This is some information that people who are healthy should know right now so they can stay healthy for the next 15, 20, 50 years, whatever it may be. This is a great um, bit of information, you know, as you look at your sleep, how well you're sleeping based upon your wearable device, which you're, you're targeting your max heart rate, et cetera, to know your glucose is, uh, is really quite breathtaking. One of the neat tricks is if you know that you slept really poorly last night, whether you're using an aura ring to track it or you look at your level of health, like, wow, it's okay to have breakfast even if you plan to fast. In fact, it's probably a good idea. Have some protein, have some fat, have some fiber. And when you do that, that's probably not a day to push yourself on a longer fast because you didn't sleep right. So it's that ability to be kind to yourself. And Dr. Perlmutter, something that I'm doing that I've never done for one, one of my books before, I'm teaching this book for two weeks as a gift for people who read the book. Uh, be, every morning, a video, three live Q&As, and we've got more than 20,000 people who are going to be doing intermittent fast with me and learning how to do the hacks. And the final one or two days of this is going to be a spiritual fast, where I actually lead them through breathing exercises and meditations around gratitude, where you do the more traditional fast where, oh, today I'm going to rest, I'm going to reflect, and I'm going to use the power of fasting to, to go within, even though during the work week, you were actually using it to power through your day. And I've never done this before, but the, the response has been overwhelming. And it's- So where can people go to learn about that? Fastthisway.com. And you can send your receipt to the book in, <laughs> but I mean, you can go there and sign up for the, the fasting challenge. You'll want the book, even if you don't have it. And I would be honored to teach people this because it is 
it, it's free. It's less than an egg McMuffin in the morning. And you feel so much better. And, and your healthcare costs over the decades are likely to go down if you're intermittent fasting. It's such, it's such a freeing thing. But to get to do it right versus, oh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to do it. And then you're going to yell at someone at 11. And maybe you won't do that. Maybe you're strong enough. But I know I was like that. And so if I can help people avoid the speed bumps, use less willpower, the leftover willpower goes into being nice to each other. <laughs> and that's really well, important. Right? You know, the, the fact that, that you're doing this with a lot of other people is very, very supportive. We did, as you know, I think it was in, uh, gee, when did we do that? That was in the beginning of, the, it was in late June. We did a fasting challenge and we had yeah. tens of thousands of people. And we, in, you were actually, I think on our last day, we interviewed you. Yeah. And uh, it, it was so supportive to know that we were in a group with a lot of other people. And for many people, it was their first time. It was the first time that they felt uh, a degree of comfort getting away from three meals a day. I don't know who invented three meals a day. I'd love to know where that came from. I think it had to do with the work shift or something it like did. that. But the reality is that it is just a human construct that is not based in physiology. And, uh, you know, we need to really uh, challenge that. And I think what you're talking about I and mean, what FASC is talking about is Go ahead and stress your body a little bit. It will respond uh, and, and bring you health and, uh, and increase your health span when we stress our bodies, in this case, by, by, by fasting, by trying to emulate the, the uh, challenges to our genome, to our DNA that uh, mimics what our, our ancestors must have done. It, it absolutely mimics what our ancestors did. And the cool thing, uh, and I get into this in, in the book, is that when you fast, it opens up sensors in your body. So we're, okay, the longer you go without food, the more you become in tune with the environment around you. And that's because you're supposed to be paying attention so you can find something to eat. <laughs> so your energy levels go up, your ketones go up, and your sensors open. And if you're fasting and you go for a walk in the park, you actually feel different than if you go for a walk in the park when you've just eaten. And it's, by the way, it's a great idea to walk after you just eat. If you look at your levels monitor, you always find moving after eating thumbs up. But there's that special state. And hunters used to know this. And you know, people in the military know this. And so bringing back this idea that we can become more connected to the world by occasionally going without food, even if we're not hungry. And the idea that being without doesn't equal hunger is a really important thing. You, you talk about how fasting amplifies something called NAD. Why is that important? NAD is one of those amazing anti-aging molecules. It drops 90% as you go from age zero to age 90. So it really declines. And it's one of the things your mitochondria use to make and transport energy. And you can supplement NAD. And you and I have both written about it uh, in our books. And what happens when you do intermittent fasting or longer term fasting is your NAD levels go back up. So there, there's just this huge stack of benefits and more studies are happening right now uh, where it's just continuously growing and growing and growing. We're saying, wow, all of the aging pathways that we look at, it's like, oh, it looks like fasting helps with that and it helps with that and it helps with that. And the reason I think fasting is so powerful is that a lot of times the stuff we're eating, it's a mix of energy, which is good. It's a mix of nutrients, which are good. And it's a mix of anti-nutrients, which are irritating. And when you fast, you avoid doing any anti-nutrients, anything that's making you weak, you don't do, right? And then where are you gonna get energy? Well, you're breathing 30 pounds of air and you're gonna get the energy from your store of energy. And when you do that, you're burning cleaner, you're making more energy. And I think that also helps get you into this focus mode. That's really, it's relaxing and liberating to have that level of, uh, just that level of, of uh, just ability to move and think and be uh, without, that 15% of the average person's thoughts being about what's their next meal. And I found a study, by the way, 15% of, of, of everything you think is tacos, donuts, uh, sandwiches, pizza, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you, you know, one thing uh, is uh, about NAD, I had a, the opportunity to chat yesterday with a, a uh, Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard, oh, who's done they, a lot of the work, he's done a lot of the work with NAD and sirtuin. Yeah. So, we know that, that the sirtuin genes and then the sirtuin enzymes more specifically uh, require uh, NAD to do their job, to do DNA repair, to help us uh, in, in many ways that deal with longevity. So anything we can do, I mean, many people take 
uh, precursors, uh, either nicotinamide yeah. riboside or nicotinamide mononucleotide, in order to boost their um, NAD levels. Uh, but, you know, two of the most powerful ways that we can raise our NAD levels are exercise and fasting. So uh, what a great thing. You know, this is uh, really tapping into these extremely primitive, uh, conserved pathways that uh, really allow us to, you know, to, to stay healthy. I mean, you know, the, these are pathways that have been described uh, in organisms that have been around for over a billion years. So he, you know, his work originally be began with uh, a, a type of yeast where that's, you know, that's where he discovered this whole, how this pathway works, this uh, activation of sirtuins by NAD. And uh, even these days, I would say that anything we can do that involves NAD, like fasting, would be good even for our immune system. So, you know, as we are now in a pandemic, it might well be to consider, we are not your doctors, of course, uh, mm -hmm. but to consider that this is a powerful tool to really offset some of the things that are really associated, for example, with bad outcome as it relates to COVID-19. For example, uh, to improve your insulin sensitive sensitivity, to lower your blood sugar, to actually work to get rid of senescent uh, immune cells and repopulate with younger, more, uh, more active, more balanced immune cells. All these things I think are, you know, are really pretty timely right now. So uh, who knew that, Fasting would be another tool in the toolbox as it relates to the current situation that we're in. And I might add, as it may very well relate to your ability to respond to a vaccination, if in fact that is your choice. I love it that you bring that up. There's a chapter in Fast This Way that looks at when is fasting, based on multiple studies, um, when is fasting a good idea versus a bad idea? And there were sort of two different big works out there when you have a bacterial infection, the evidence is very strong that fasting can save your life. It is really good for you. And when you have a viral infection, having some carbohydrates to support your glucose levels for your body to, to do its uh, metabolic and its immune functions is a good thing, but not sugar, which is immunosuppressive. So you might wanna break a fast if you're fighting a virus. You might wanna do a fast if you're fighting a bacteria. But the most important thing is that before you got either one of them, you practice intermittent fasting regularly so your cells work well and you've got enough resilience and metabolic power to be able to manage whether it's a bacteria or a virus. So this is about really powering up what I call your inner mask, you know, your immune function that's always there, right? And you wanna be able to make that stronger. Intermittent fasting does that. And then you choose, okay, do I wanna, do I wanna um, eat something, even some carbs, but not sugar because I am coming down with something that's probably not bacterial or wow, I've got a bacterial thing. Like I'm just going to skip a day of eating. And the, the results for sepsis and bacterial are very powerful for fasting. So I, I was impressed. And I, I wrote that specifically because of the pandemic and just saying, guys, the power that happens from fasting when you're well is what makes you power through what happens when you get sick. I would say that uh, a study I reviewed yesterday that was published just last month revealed that, you know, one of the things that uh, NAD does is it amplifies uh, DNA repair mechanisms that require something called PARPs. And the, the study looked at the antiviral activity of PARPs. So, you know, there's a lot of information there, I think, that really needs to be teased out a little bit. Now, let's talk for just a minute. You did talk about supplements uh, extensively in the book. And what would be, let's say, the bare bones kind of approach to supplements that you think these days are reasonable to be uh, considered if an individual is going to begin fasting from time to time? One of the most important supplements to take is magnesium. And so many of us are deficient in magnesium that it just, it makes sense because you wanna control your electrolytes anyway. And even a pinch of salt, Himalayan salt or sea salt in water can be really beneficial during a fast to make you feel better. And I still believe that vitamin D is a very powerful thing to do. I like it with vitamin A and vitamin K2 as well. You can do that during a fast and, and it's not gonna break your fast. And it might not absorb as well. If you take it with other fats, it'll absorb better, but it'll still absorb better than nothing. And then there are some supplements that you really can take during a fast that amplify the effects of a fast, which is really cool. One of the big ones is proteolytic or protein digesting enzymes. 
And what those do is they help the body while it's going into this process of autophagy, they help it to break down excessive protein floating around so you can excrete it. And the most common one is seropeptase. I talked about some other types of protein digesting enzymes, but those aren't gonna break your fast. They are though gonna help your body do more cleanup at the same time. And there's a new one that I didn't even get to include in the book because you could not buy it in the US uh, when I went to press and it just came out and it's called spermidine. And spermidine is, yes, it, it was originally discovered in what it sounds like it was discovered in. And it is tied to all sorts of anti-aging effects in the body, including it mimics a fast. So if you take spermidine during a fast, it's like turning up the fast and it doesn't break the fast. So I take spermidine on a daily basis now. And I think there's really good evidence. It was, I was in my anti-aging book, but I'm like, sorry guys, you can't buy this yet. But when it comes out, it's gonna be powerful. And it's, I think for four months now, it's been available in the US. So that's something that I, I would add in if I was able to make an edit to the book right now. Uh, any supplements you can uh, talk about that kind, uh, uh, aside from spermidine that might be uh, so-called fasting mimetics? Um, there's some evidence for things like resveratrol and pterostilbene. Uh, that you might want to take those uh, during a fast. There's also some people who would say, hey, you know, take metformin, which is a, a diabetes drug during a fast. I'm not convinced that that's the right thing to do. Uh, because metformin can reduce some mitochondrial function stuff, and you might want to just let the fast do its job. I don't think we have good evidence on fasting plus metformin yet, at least if there is, I haven't seen it. Do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that the notion of metformin during a fast might be something you, you, sh you probably shouldn't do, because if, especially if you have a, a, a delicate uh, blood sugar uh, issue, then you, have, you run the risk of hypoglycemia then uh, even greater. But having said that, uh, I think the latest literature would indicate that the uh, blood levels that you achieve of metformin when you're taking a pharmaceutical dose are really not high enough to uh, downregulate complex one of mitochondrial activity, which is what we've all been talking about for a long time. You know, so when mitochondria become dysfunctional, we have an energy uh, deficit, and therefore that's what stimulates AMP kinase. I think we're getting this sense now that there are other uh, pathways to stimulate AMP kinase and uh, directly uh, reestablish glu uh, glucose sensitivity, actually help with the transposition of the GLUT4 uh, channel uh, in, mm -hmm. without even in involving insulin. So uh, I think we're learning, uh, but I am amazed at the number of researchers who are involved in this kind of stuff, who are taking, who do not have diabetes and who are taking metformin. And uh, you know, the truth of the matter is there, there may be a, a time when you and I have a conversation and I tell you that I'm taking it. So I'm still looking at the literature. And um, I have to admit, uh, last year I went to a, uh, a longevity uh, conference, XPRIZE for longevity, and I was very impressed with the number of researchers, brilliant people from around the world who were taking metformin, uh, which, you know, there are several studies that look at all-cause mortality and show significant reduction in all-cause all mortality in people taking metformin. So uh, it, I'm going to keep my eye on, the, on this one. I'm going to keep my ear to the ground. It's interesting because the, the very first company that figured out metformin triggers the same genetic changes that fasting does was called Biomarker Pharmaceuticals in 2003. And I, I went and I met the research team and I talked to them and I started taking it for three years back then. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to live for a long time. I should do this. And what I found out uh, was over time, it does reduce uh, one of the phases of mitochondrial respiration. It can lower VO2 max. It inhibits your body's ability to absorb B12. And so I'm always torn and I've gone on and off it. It inhibits your ability to, to benefit from exercise in large part. If you take metformin while you're exercising, you get a much smaller um, uh, benefit. So I'm really torn. I believe the right thing is going to be metformin two days a week, three days a week, but not every day. And that we're going to yeah, end I, up. I think we're going to need to nuance this and yeah. uh, I'm trying to gather more data. Uh, you know, one study that uh, impressed me appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine probably about a decade ago, and it compared in pre-diabetics lifestyle change versus metformin without the lifestyle change over time. What was the percentage of people who converted to diabetes? And they noted that, as a matter of fact, those people who engaged exercise and changed their diets, their rate of conversion to diabetes was slightly lower than the rate of conversion to diabetes people taking metformin. But 
death rate in the uh, people taking metformin was twice as high. Still, it was low, but the rate of, of death was higher in that particular study, though there are, as I mentioned, the all-cause mortality studies that have, that have come out since that time showing a reduction. So uh, I, I think that uh, for now, uh, we could tell people that about the wonders of fasting and exercise uh, and you know the nutritional substance that you've mentioned, uh, berberine, if you want to try to maybe sneak into that pathway a little bit without... Uh, going to a pharmaceutical, perhaps. But uh, I think you got a lot of great information uh, in this book, and I'm sure it's going to be a very, very big hit for you. Thank you, Dr. Perlmutter. And I mean, you've, you've endorsed uh, my, my books before, and I'm, just, I'm grateful for your work in the world. You're, you know, you're one of the, the, the guys I truly look up to because you've been helping a lot of people for a long time with, with cutting edge knowledge. So it's always an honor to be your friend, uh, to be on the show with you, and just to be able to, uh, to pick your brain and I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. And guys, if, if you are interested, Fast This Way, go to fastthisway.com. I'd love to, to share the book with you in more detail. And uh, I've just got to say, um, you're one of the, the guys I trust the most. Uh, if, if I had a real serious metabolic question, wasn't sure what to do, I would call you up and say, what do you think? Because you've you have the knowledge, you have the depth of that. Oh, you're, you're very kind. Yeah, thank you. I, I will put the link uh, in the text for uh, this Instagram, which will live on Instagram TV and uh, give our love to Lana. We miss you guys. We'll, we'll definitely try to see you when we come out again and have dinner like we did. And uh, I hope to make that happen. All right. You're always welcome. <laughs> All right. Bye for now. Bye.